You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Welcome to this episode of the Disease to Shore podcast on the topic of artificial intelligence use in veterinary medicine with Dr. Parminder Basran. I'm your host, Kim Brown, editor of Equimanagement. My co-host is Carly Sisson, digital content manager. The Disease to Shore podcast is brought to you in 2023 by Merck Animal Health. Basran is a PhD as well as a fellow of the Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine. He is an Associate Research Professor, Section of Medical Oncology, in the Department of Clinical Sciences at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. He has more than 20 years of experience as a medical physicist in human oncology. He said he was excited to bring his medical physicist knowledge to Cornell through research, education, and clinical support. He said, while the patients are different, my ethos remains the same, to improve the quality of care for cancer patients through the introduction of evidence-based technologies and pragmatic processes in our fast-paced environment. Thank you, Dr. Basram, for joining us today on Disease Du Jour to talk about artificial intelligence and equine veterinary medicine. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's going to be a lot of fun, I'm sure. I think this is going to be so exciting. We hear so much about artificial intelligence and you can't turn the TV on or listen to anything or be online without seeing it. But I know that we're still in veterinary medicines a little confused about what all does this mean? And I know... You contributed to a December 22 issue of the Journal of Veterinary Radiology Radiology and Ultrasound about artificial intelligence. And the articles on there are open access, and they're meant to give a broad view on the topic. And we're going to make sure and put a link to these articles in the written summary of this podcast on equimanagement.com. But Cornell had actually talked to you about this issue, and you were quoted as saying, and I had to use this because this was great, these articles provided a great starting point for anyone who wants to learn about AI and veterinary medicine. While much of the focus is on diagnostic imaging, many of the articles cover topics broad enough to provide a general understanding of AI-related subjects. They're an accessible and readable set of articles that the community will hopefully enjoy. And I'm sure they will. I I read through them and it was, I I highly recommend that if you're listening to the podcast, you go to equimanagement.com and you look up this particular uh, podcast and in the article that goes along with the summary, you will we will have a link that will go to these open access articles. So I'm just really excited about this. So let's start, Dr. Bazran. In general, how can artificial intelligence help veterinarians and their patients? There's a there's a number of ways um, I think you can you can leverage AI technologies um, to help veterinarians. Um, I, I kind of break them down into about five or four different places. Um, the big, the big area is, is an image analysis. Another one is diagnostic uh, decision support tools. Um, there's a, an emerging field of drug discovery. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, predictive modeling. Um, so very briefly, um, with regards to image analysis, uh, we can use AI algorithms to help find features within things like x-rays and CT scans to help diagnose um, or analyze these images. Um, to date, there's a couple of commercial entities that provide AI-based medical image analysis, largely to help radiologists to, to get through a lot of their caseloads. Um, there is a shortage of veterinary radiologists, and so this, this is an option for, for a lot of um, uh, communities. Um, another, another area is sort of like that realm of diagnostics and decision support. We're seeing AI algorithms being developed to help diagnose uh, animals with various conditions using data sets that can range anywhere from like uh, age, sex, weight, uh, to whole slide images, uh, biospecimen samples like blood smear analysis, uh, infrared and conventional imaging sensors, GPS tracking systems, and all sorts of novel ways to collect data from animals that can be used to to help in uh, decision support and diagnostics. And there's this field of drug discovery, uh, a little bit more sort of on the um, you know, like uh, maybe on the commercial side, uh, where people can do use uh, techniques, uh, machine learning techniques, which is kind of a subfield of AI to help analyze these huge streams of data that are generated when people collect genomics data or proteomics data or metabolomics or other kinds of omics data. Uh, analyzing uh, this data to help 
see if there are, are things like uh, inhibitors or promoters that could be used to to uh, to exploit uh, in in the process of discovering drugs to treat uh, serious conditions. And then finally, that last thing is that sort of predictive modeling, where you can use these AI algorithms to predict uh, various types of conditions. Uh, so in the case of uh, equine medicine, uh, there's been some research on uh, you know developing models to predict uh, laminitis, uh, catastrophic fractures from proximal sesamoid bones, and and other kinds of conditions. Wow, that this is going to be an exciting time to be in veterinary medicine just because you have a shortage of vets and suddenly you've got some tools that are coming in that can actually help you save time in, in what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of really uh, important things where we might be able to use these technologies to help veterinarians. And so some of the important things that I can sort of list off at the top of my head are Things like improving uh, the diagnostic accuracy. So when when a when a an expert, a veterinary radiologist, for example, uh, when they have a suspicion of what this X-ray might be looking like, they can refer to an AI system to help improve the accuracy of that diagnostic uh, assessment. Uh, there's the the whole sort of speeding up of diagnosis. So uh, can we uh, analyzing large data sets, for example? Uh, to uh, to come up with a solution or to come up with a prediction a lot faster uh, that process so so um, one of the I'll, I can touch on this a little bit later but one of the areas where uh, there are some sort of sweet spots where AI could really be used to significantly speed up the time uh, to analyze or process data it's things like uh, image segmentation which is if you have a three-dimensional imaging data set like an MRI or a CT, sometimes you need to identify certain bones or certain tissues in that region, in that, in that volume. Um, the, the conventional approach is for someone to painstakingly uh, draw on each of these uh, images. But, but now uh, we've uh, seen, certainly in human medicine, uh, people deploying uh, AI systems uh, that can automatically segment all the types of tissues that are in that, uh, that, that tissue. So, or in that uh, 3D volume. So we can leverage, and these things can take, you know, typically, you know, one or two days to do manually, which can be done literally in minutes. So that can be huge uh, uh, time saving. Um, there's the concept of personalized medicine, you know, and can we use AI, can these AI technologies help uh, personalize uh, the kinds of treatments uh, uh, for, for uh, a patient, as opposed to uh, looking at it from a broad population perspective? Um, and then there's also just uh, along that line, there's identifying animals that might be at risk. You know, can you use these AI algorithms to AI algorithms, I should say, uh, to uh, identify um, animals that might be at risk for certain conditions, like some of our research, which is focusing on um, identifying uh, features within uh, certain bones of horses, if there are other gray sources, which might uh, suggest that these animals might be uh, prone to some catastrophic failures on the race horse. Race wow. Track, I should say. That would be great because it's, that's been, I've been in this for about 40 years and it's been kind of the uh, big goal is to try and figure out ahead of time what might we be able to do to diagnose these horses earlier who are at risk. So that's exciting. Yeah, there's, there's actually, you know, it's, it's amazing how fast the, the, the space has exploded over the last several years. Uh, and it really comes down to uh, people having access to digital data and leveraging that digital data. So those institutions and those those uh, communities which have lots of the data in a digital form can deploy this brand new hammer uh, to 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 knock out you know to knock on these problems. So so that's the exciting part, and it's probably another important point in this broader discussion about. Uh, AI in general, you know, like we, we, we talk about the importance, you know, the, the potential of AI, but it's really not possible unless you have data that is in a format that can be used by an AI system, right? So, so you know, the, the long gone are the days of patient charts, which are paper-based and, and that kind of thing. We really need to uh, think about the data more carefully and digitizing it, and which in itself is no simple feat. Oh, boy, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that I hadn't even thought about that. All of the there's so many little data points have been collected over the decades that could suddenly 
reveal things, trends that we've never even noticed before. Yeah. And, and it's, I, I have this conversation regularly with, uh, with students about the, the difference between data, information, and knowledge. Those are three very important separate things. And in, in the veterinary setting, I think what's happened, what happens is that the data and the knowledge and the information, those three things are kind of in, like, encased in the veterinarian's experts inside their brains. And so a big part of our challenge is, is, is actually teasing out that knowledge uh, that the veterinarian has. Like, how do, we, uh, how, do we, how do we drill down into the thought processes that are occurring inside the veterinarian's mind to come up with a model that makes sense for us to use? That's assuming that we have the data that's in a digital form in the first place. In fact, that's, that's actually not a very challenging thing, right? Like we can take lots of video data. We can take lots of GPS data. You can just, you can just buy these things and, and then convert that. And, you know, if you have the infrastructure, you can, you can kind of get that data. But that going from data to information is a very difficult challenge. And then going from that information to knowledge, how do we use that information and come up with better ways of, uh, you know, decision support tools or, or treating animals and, and improving the quality of care of animals. That's the, that's the tough part. Today's Diseased is Your podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the maker of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their unconditional investment in our industry, profession, and community through programs such as the Respiratory Biosurveillance Program, the partnership with Equitrace, which delivers secure, streamlined record keeping and instantaneous temperature measurements when coupled with Merck Animal Health Biotherm Microchips. Visit MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com for more information. I can I can predict there's so many veterinarians that I know of who are research minded and they're like, oh my gosh, I've got all these records. I wish I could go through and look at XYZ. And it's like, this this may be the start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's uh... One of the things that's really, um, really exciting about certainly within the environment that we're working here in Cornell is, is the ability for us to have a lot of data that's in a digital form, which is really the tough part. And it is no simple feat, you know, like uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of the challenges that are associated with AI are driven by the data that's used to, you know, to develop those models. So. If you think about the process in, in AI generally, in any kind of machine learning, the way that this works is that you, you have to have some data set, you have to have some important questions, you're either going to try and try to classify something or predict a number, uh, we call them classification problems or regression problems, um, and then you build, and then you use one of, you know, a bajillion different AI systems with neural networks and so forth to make this prediction. But the data that we use, um, is we have to be really careful about it because that data, if it's a single institution, for example, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you, you know, someone could develop a model in their institution and come up with these beautiful, you know, highly accurate systems and models to predict something. But if they were to deploy this in a different environment, somewhere across the ground, you know, around the world, or, you know, even just in, a, in a, another hospital down the road, they might find that those models fail miserably. And we've seen this now uh, in human medicine. So we've, this is a common problem. It's called the data shift problem where the models are not generalizable. So we have to think about that quality of the data. Uh, are they multiple institutions? If they are multiple institution data, then we have a broader set of data sets from which an AI system can learn from. Um, so, so these are really important questions uh, that we need to ask when we're developing these models. And, and also for a lot of the practitioners out there that aren't going to be developing models, we have to have the practitioners ask those kinds of questions like, well, if you're going to sell me this AI system that predicts something, where, where is the model data set coming from? Is it relevant to my practice? Uh, does it make sense for me to be uh, predicting X, Y, and Z for in my scenario when it's not relevant to my community? These are all really tough questions. <laughs> that we're just scratching the surface uh, of in, in, in human medicine and in veterinary medicine. 
I mean, that to me, this is just so exciting, even even at my advanced age. So veterinarians out there, if you're, you know, e- even if you've been in practice for a while, this may be the coolest thing that you have seen because it can take all of the, the things that you have stuck away in your files and may be able to contribute to learning. Maybe we can figure out how to solve laminitis finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there, there's a. There's been some pretty uh, cool work, you know, like every day there's a new publication coming out and some AI system in equine medicine. And, and, and so uh, I saw I came across a paper uh, recently that, that had explored uh, that specific issue. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, if you wait long enough, I'm sure someone's. Going to How widespread so- is AI modeling currently in veterinary medicine? Is it mainly happening at the major research universities or is this something that private hospitals are adopting? I think it's a combination of both, but I think the, the the larger institutions have some advantages in the sense that uh, they can see cases from, you know, a, they have a larger pool of cases from which to have the data sets. Now, if you if you were to develop an AI model, like uh, an AI model from scratch, you typically need like tens of thousands of data sets to train on for it to predict and do a good job. But you can use some clever mathematics and clever software to to re- significantly reduce that down. And you know, I, I hate to throw a number out there, but um, generally, you see a lot of people that would publish results based on numbers that might be on the order of like a hundred cases. So if you have a hundred cases uh, or somewhere in that space where you have a couple of really definitive diagnoses, you could you could develop a model. So, and if you get to that spot to get to 100 cases is no easy feat, right? Um, so that's something to, that, that, so that's the biggest challenge is that, you know, access to the data is, is a big, big is, is the biggest challenge in the veterinary medicine. Sitting here talking to general practitioners for the most part, we do have researchers and, and folks in universities listening, but just talking to the equine veterinarian in the field, how is this going to benefit the equine veterinarian in the field in the future? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not exactly, you know, a, a practitioner, but, but I can make some, some, some sort of um, broad sort of uh, statements. And I think, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of these things earlier. Um, you know, for I think that things like image analysis, you know, using x-ray images and MRI images and, and doing a very, you know, doing quicker diagnosis on these data sets, I think that's going to help. Um, AI systems are going to help with that. Um, there's been some work on lameness detection where uh, people have developed some AI algorithms to detect for limb lameness. And I think that, you know, if, if that data starts to evolve or if people start to pool data sets together, that could really help um, for, you know, in, in that field. Colic detection, um, there's been a couple of studies that have looked at using um, sort of classical features like, you know, sex history, age, uh, heart rate, and, and those kinds of things to predict. Um, whether uh, animals are, or beef horses are uh, have colic or if they are going to be successful in surgery. Um, again, I think the more the more data sets that we have that are used in these models, the, the better they will be. Um, another interesting uh, sort of space in equine medicine is the performance prediction problem. So like if you have horse races, um, what kinds of features uh, of that horse race might be um, beneficial for, you know, uh, you know, racing outcomes. So how is there a relationship between certain features and racing outcomes? So there's a, a Kaggle contest. So these Kaggles are these sort of online uh, contests that people can have where they can post data sets and sometimes they can win prizes if they develop like the best performing AI algorithm. Um, so there is one Kaggle out there um, on thoroughbred racing in Hong Kong um, where people have, uh, there's like 6,000 data sets and with all sorts of data, you know, all sorts of fields, such as placings and weddings and so forth, where people can actually develop and build their own models, um, all these kinds of things. So, so those are some of the spaces where, you know, like with an equine medicine, I think that might be, might be promising. Well, I think my last question is, so what are you working on right now? What's some of the research that, that's going on with you? 
Well, uh, so I have a, a, a broad range of AI related uh, research um, in veterinary medicine. So uh, with regards to equine uh, medicine, as, as I mentioned, we're looking at using machine learning approaches, AI approaches to, to you know, predict the risk of catastrophic fracture in, uh, from CT images uh, in, in racehorses. So, so the idea here is that maybe we could develop something like a, a screening tool that could identify you know, whether a horse might be at risk of a fracture. Um, and then you know, there could be some intervention there. So, so that's one area that, uh, that I've been working in. Other areas um, in veterinary medicine generally, um, we have projects uh, that are, we have a one really great project on um, using uh, computer vision technologies to um, predict the risk of mastitis in dairy cows. So uh, in these large commercial dairy farms, there, there's you know, thousands of, of cows and, and often a veterinarian needs to go into the manual assessments on the risk of mastitis. And so we're developing computer vision approaches uh, to, to see if we can um, automate that process, which is another really sort of uh, a great opportunity in AI in general. This is the whole concept of, of, of automation. Uh, and removing that step of someone having to physically be there. Uh, um, so there's one project on, on dairy cows. Um, we have another project on cats where we are using uh, machine learning ideas to predict whether cats, uh, the small intestines of cats, uh, the ultrasound images of small intestines of cats are suggestive of um, inflammatory bowel disease or fulma cancer conditions. And so we're using uh, that in combination with blood serum biomarkers uh, and developing machine learning models to, to help uh, aid in the diagnosis of that. Um, and then we have other, uh, other side projects on uh, cancer. We have, we're doing some work in radiation um, treatments for uh, osteosarcomas in dogs uh, and, and using some machine learning approaches to help uh, analyze images uh, for for the prediction of different kinds of uh, cancers from CT images. Well, those are just incredible. I'm I'm sure, Dr. Basran, we're going to have to have you back on here because I'm just guessing that this is going to be changing so quickly and really coming into use in veterinary medicine. Is there anything else that you would like to tell equine veterinarians about artificial intelligence and, and veterinary practice? Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, hold on to your hats. <laughs> uh, you know things are things are things are happening really quickly. I, I, one thing that I want to, to to say to to the broad community is is that you know I think people are. I, I'm pretty sure that most everyone has you know has been aware of this ChatGPT, these large language models, uh, and they're finding it you know pretty amazing and pretty pretty exciting stuff. One of the things that I would like to, to mention about these things is the fact that at the heart of it, they are computer algorithms. You know, they're not people, they're not sentient beings. Uh, what they're doing is they're providing um, answers, they're, they're parroting answers based on information that they've learned in, or data sets that they've learned in the past. So while I think these AI systems are really cool and really interesting. They're not a panacea. They're not going to solve all of our world's problems. And so the the, the so I would I would always uh, suggest people to take take these things with a grain of salt. There's always lots of uh, failures. We've seen a lot of issues and issues with uh, AI systems, you know, catastrophically uh, failing. And so. Um, while it's really great to be excited about these things, we also need to have a heavy dose of skepticism uh, with these AI technologies. So that would be my final comment for, for anyone uh, listening. Well, thank you again so much for joining us today on the Disease Du Jour podcast. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Merck Animal Health, who lets us have these types of conversations. And if any of our listeners have any questions or suggestions, you can send an email to me at kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at equinenetwork.com. Disease Du Jour is part of the Horse Radio Network, a leading podcast network for horse lovers worldwide and a division of Equine Network. 